Welcome and thank you for joining us for this episode of the Crexy Podcast, an insider's look at all things commercial real estate. I'm your host, Giannis Papadakis, Business Development Manager at Crexy, and today we are thrilled to sit down with Cynthia Daughtry. Before we dive in, a little bit about our guest. Cynthia Daughtry has been a practicing attorney for the past 33 years. In 1989, she began her career as an assistant district attorney, Milwaukee County, Wisconsin. In 1995, Ms. Daughtry moved to Colorado, where she practiced law in areas of real estate, including metropolitan districts and water law, local government, and contracts in private practice, local government, and corporate legal settings. Currently, Ms. Daughtry owns Bayer & Associates LLC law firm and is one of the founders of Westward Advisors, brokered by EXP Commercial. Westward Advisors focuses on assisting clients with purchasing resort, ranch, investment, and preservation properties. Cynthia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I am very excited to be here and talk about all things Crexy and commercial here in Colorado. Fantastic. Well, before we do that, I wanted to throw you a little curveball and just get to know you a little bit. I'm interested to know, who is your favorite fictional lawyer? Okay, this is going to date me, but um, I grew up in the area where there was reruns of Perry Mason. So back in the day when I was coming home from school in fourth grade and would sit after school and we'd watch a little bit of TV, um, Perry Mason would come on and I was just infatuated. So for me, I was a kid that grew up at a farm in northwestern Minnesota. So this was the closest thing to the big city that I could see or to ever discover. So for me, just seeing that and from that time on, any lawyer show that came on, I was enamored with and just loved watching, you know, how they presented a case, how they got through the court. And that was how and why I decided I want to be just like that when I grow up. Fantastic. Okay. I, I had a little bet with myself that you were going to say Better Call Saul just because it's, you know, the most recent and newest, you know, lawyer TV series. Have you, have you seen Better Call Saul? Are you into that show? Actually, yes. And the interesting thing is my husband um, what, had lived in Albuquerque for many years. And so when we were watching Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad, he was always great about pointing out, OK, that that is where the Owl Cafe is or where that is. Twisters, that's really this in the show. So it was always interesting to get the the natives view on Better Call Saul, at least for the geographic locations of where things took place. Awesome. Okay. Well, we've got an exciting talk track that I'm uh, really happy to get through with you today because I think uh, our listeners are really going to find a lot of value in kind of your experience and, you know, how you've approached the market um, with, you know, the, the training and, and your history. You have a very fascinating background that spans across land development and law. Can you walk us through your career and how and why you got into litigation? Sure. When I first started out, uh, when I was in law school, I went to the University of North Dakota School of Law. And between my second and third year, I decided I wanted to come to Colorado because I wanted to be a water rights attorney. Because as I was in law school, I was thinking, okay, what's an area of law that is always going to be in need, where there's always going to be business going on with it? And I had taken a water law class. And I, the more I went through it, the more I thought about it. And I said to myself, you know, Colorado would be the perfect place for that. And there was actually a year ahead of me, there were two gals in the year ahead of me that went out to Colorado and clerked as summer associates for water rights attorneys. And I said, oh, I want to do the exact same thing. So between my second and third year, I came out, got a job with a law firm, Harvey W. Curtis. Harvey, it was perfect timing. Harvey was a farm kid from Iowa. I was a farm kid from Minnesota, so we really hit it off. He had a gal, uh, Star Waring, that was in the process of having her second baby. So she was going to be gone, so he needed some help. He had some upcoming trials coming up for two of his clients, City of Broomfield and another client. So he said, you have great timing. And before I know it, I was hired and I was a summer associate for Harvey. And that was really getting into Colorado water law and, you know, getting my foot in the courtroom for the very first time. Exciting. Now, litigation is really like the, the point guard, uh, you know, in sports terms of like the law, the legal team, right? You're on the court 
you're actually in front of the judge, you're talking and making arguments. And it's got to be both exhilarating and stressful at the same time. Yes, extremely exhilarating. And um, you never know what's going to happen. So to kind of take it forward, after I finished up that summer, that was the summer of 1987. And Colorado was just on the cusp of starting to see a downturn in the economy. And so unfortunately, Harvey couldn't offer me a job. So what happened was when I graduated from law school, I got um, out to Wisconsin, applied for a position with the Milwaukee County District Attorney's Office, and really got my foot in the door with doing litigation. Because when you're a prosecuting attorney, you are doing jury trials, you're doing bench trials, you're doing motions practice, you are putting the case together from start to finish. And the interesting thing when you first start out in court like that, you literally had a banker's box full of files because they start you out in misdemeanor and traffic court. And you've got that whole box to work through because that's your caseload for the day. And you figure out what's going to trial, what's not going to trial. But that was such a great area for me to cut my teeth, so to speak, of doing litigation because you had to think on your feet because you never knew what was going to go to trial from when you walked in the courtroom in the morning to you know what happened after lunch and sometimes it would be open up the file look at it and say ladies and gentlemen of the jury this case is about a retail theft <laughs> <laughs> and um through the years, I was very fortunate at the Milwaukee County District Attorney's Office, rose through the ranks, and when I left in 1995, I had spent the two previous years in the felony drug unit, so I got to do felony drug cases and working with the team on that, and um, then it was time to move to Colorado because the opportunities were finally opening up at that point in time in Colorado. Now, how did you ultimately dive into the world of commercial real estate? Well, interestingly enough, a lot of the stuff that I did when I came to Colorado with water, um, you need to have water no matter what you're doing, whether um, for your city, for any type of your development, because a lot of cities are looking, if you're going to do development, you need to have what's called a change of use. So you need to be familiar with water rights that's so dominant in Colorado. And then another thing that happened um, after I spent six and a half years with Harvey, I made the transition over to the Jefferson County Attorney's Office. I was fortunate enough to get a position with the Jefferson County Airport, which is now called the Rocky Mountain Airport, Rocky Mountain Metro. With that, they had a number of different parcels that they were looking at doing development on. And so they needed someone to be their attorney, represent the county, and how they were going forward with that development and trying to figure out, okay, what's the highest and best use for this piece of property so that we're making sure that we're getting the right type of clients in, the right commercial development. And so that time within the Jefferson County Attorney's Office, that was it, it was another building block, so to speak, in, in learning more about commercial real estate. So each step of my career is just kind of taking me more into commercial real estate and just kind of drawing in all the experience from what I'm doing at that point in time. How does your attorney background inform your current line of work? And I, I know it doesn't necessarily directly overlap all the time, uh, but, I'm curious to see, you know, as you know, transitioning from you know litigating in the courtroom to you know focusing on commercial real estate, you know, what do you find uh, you've kept in terms of you know your process, your workflow, uh, and what's different? Um, well, what's what's same is the preparation because when you're doing litigation you have to be very prepared and have your documents in order and be very organized because as you go through the litigation cycle especially in civil there is the rules of civil procedure so you have certain deadlines that you have to have um, your witness list in depositions done your discovery done your expert witness um, information in and then you have to have the accumulation of documents making sure that you have everything that you need disclosed to the other side. And in some ways, that's very similar to what you have to do with commercial real estate, because 
when you interview a client, you're talking with that client and you're discovering, well, tell me more about that property. What is it that, you know, what made you buy that property in the first place? And the questioning that you do on the litigation side to prepare yourself for trial are, is a great way and a great technique to also draw those questions out and draw that information out from your commercial real estate clients because learning why they brought bought the property learning how um, you know what they want to move on to next why do they want to go into that type of um, structure that type of development and then you know what are the benefits that someone might get from purchasing their property that they're looking to sell and then also in addition to that pulling together the documents from your commercial real estate client of, okay, we need to have, you know, the plans and specs for the building, because if someone's going to look at it, you know, what does the building look like? What happened when it was first, when it was first built, when it was, you know, what are the uses for it? And so the detective work that you need to do and putting together your, your pictures for your brochures and, you know, doing that thinking and putting together the, presentation that you're going to do when you pitch that not only to your client but to other potential clients that might be interested in purchasing that purchasing that exact property right can you tell me a little bit about what aspects of commercial real estate your firm specializes in sure so I have partnered up with Lindsay Stepe, who is a luxury residential broker, and she is on the EXP Realty side. Lindsay is up in Breckenridge, Colorado, has been a longtime realtor up there. So with Lindsay, she is very familiar with the Summit County market, with Breckenridge, Silverthorne, Dillon, um, and also going over the hill, so to speak, to Fair Play, Buena Vista, and Salida. And Lindsay has an extensive background because she was a broker and did development back in the day in Denver, Colorado. So with her background with doing development for multifamily, commercial developments, and then her knowledge of Summit County, we've decided to partner up with, with her knowledge and my legal skills and my access and resources on the commercial side that has just made, it's been a great partnership for the two of us to move forward with our, with our company. So what we like to focus on are the resort communities. We like to focus on ranch and we like to focus on investment. And we also focus on preservation because what we're looking for are clients that are, want to have a legacy property. And that might be a legacy cabin up in the woods that everyone comes to visit and has those very special holiday memories or maybe it's a legacy property that's a ranch that just keeps getting passed down from generation to generation where they keep going that cattle operation the horse operation or whatever it is just to keep the agricultural background going and for me coming from an agricultural background of having a family farm and knowing all the work and effort that goes into it, it's very important to both of us, Lindsay and I, to make sure that if a family wants to be able to do that, that we're able to offer our services and figure out how can we make that work for them in the long term. And with that, I'd like to delve more into your market and what your day to day looks like. What should our listeners know about dealing with raw land? Because, you know, personally, you know, I was a broker, I'm Marcus Millichap, I focused on apartments and uh, triple net retail properties. But every once in a while, I'd get the odd landowner that would say, hey, can you sell this piece of land? And, you know, at first glance, you think, oh, well, land is easy, right? It's just land, right? But once, but that's definitely the experience of somebody that's brand new to the business. Once you start to wrap your head around land, you realize it's a lot more complex than, you know, oftentimes properties with improvements on them. Um, what are some of the basics that people should understand about raw land? Well, one of the first things is what what are the use what are the uses for it. If you're near a metropolitan area, you're going to find that there's usually a planned, unit develop, a planned unit development for that property. There might be a long-term land use plan that the jurisdiction has in place for that property as to what they envision it's going to be or what they would like to see on it. So for instance, while you might wanna put single family homes on it, 
the city or the county or even the town might decide, you know, that's not really going to be a good tax base for us. We need something with a little bit more commercial development where we're going to have a little bit more tax return on it so that we can fund, you know, some of our basic services that we're providing. So the, you want to look at, okay, what's the use um, to what is the surrounding area doing? What's going on with it? And one of the very big things that you also have to be very cognizant of in Colorado is what are going what are going to be the water requirements? Because some jurisdictions require that you've got to bring water to the table. So by bringing water to the table, what that means is that there is some type of water which could be Colorado um, CBT, Colorado Big Thompson units, or um, some other type of water that can then be used into that city or jurisdiction's water service. Um, but it doesn't stop there because even though you might have water that you can bring, because typically what you're going to find, sometimes you've got agricultural land, the water that has been either um, ditch rights or reservoir rights or uh, a mutual ditch company, it's always been for agricultural use. Well, now once you're going to change the use on it from agricultural, that land to perhaps residential or commercial, that has to go through water court. So that's another thing that you have to be cognizant of. What's the use of the land? And if you do have water rights, what's the use of those water rights? Is it something that we can bring to the table to that jurisdiction to negotiate coming in? And then do we have to take it through water court? And that's a very unique thing in Colorado. You have to take um, water rights through water court to change the use, change the point of um, diversion, appropriation. So you want to seek out and have a good water rights attorney to help you with that. This uh, kind of brings up a question that I have, and you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know much about water rights or you know Colorado land in general, but I do remember hearing a little bit about um, some maybe agricultural landowners. You know, they may have excess water that they are not using. They can sell those water rights kind of offset it to somebody else, you know, downstream. Does that muddy up, you know, no pun intended there, kind of the the transfer process if somebody's selling a piece of land, they've already promised, you know, a piece of their water rights to somebody else. How, how complex does that get? It, I'm going to give you the lawyer answer there, Giannis. It's It depends. <laughs> Because it depends upon um, the use of those water rights. It depends on the past use of that water rights, if they've used all the water rights, if they haven't used all the water rights. And then it depends, too, on, you know, what it's going to take to take it through water court and what was um, what was all going on with those water rights. So it, it really depends on the situation with the water rights and with the water court and with the water engineer. And speaking of the water engineer, your water engineer next to your water rights attorney is going to be one of your most important friends, especially as you're looking at this, because they can do the calculations to see, okay, if we have so many CFS cubic feet per second, or so many acre feet of water that's measured, what does that mean of what we have for total use? What are the historic records showing on it in order to see you know, how really profitable is this water and is it something that's that's really truly going to work for that type of development or uses for the municipality as you go through looking at your land acquisition. And one important thing to note too is in Colorado, water rights are considered property rights and so they can be conveyed separately. So you might have a deed that conveys the southwest quarter of the northwest quarter of section six um, township and range, whatever, but it doesn't list the water rights. And if there is ditch or water rights that are used there, but they're not conveyed, the they may still be retained by the original owner on it. And that's why you need a water rights attorney because they're the only people that can give you that title, water title rights opinion to see, okay, here's the chain of title for that. Just like you go to a title company, right. give you the title chain for property. You need that water rights attorney to do that. Interesting. Um, and, and, you know, I, you're absolutely right. It's something that if you do not have an expert on your team, you could miss a glaringly obvious 
you know, mistake that, you know, somebody that knows what to look for can help you avoid, you know, immediately. Mm -hmm. I always recommend it to my clients, have a real estate attorney, somebody that you like, know, and trust, and have them look at the lease, have them look at the purchase agreement. You know, I'm not a lawyer. I can't give you legal advice, but I can tell you, you want legal advice. So um, it seems like the more specific you get into different branches of commercial real estate, really the more need you have for that specialized attorney that understands how these transactions typically happen and you know, how to avoid you know, the normal pitfalls that for you, you can look and say, oh, this isn't so complex. We just do A, B, and C. But to somebody new like myself, I'd get you know, caught up on that easily day one just because I don't know what to look for. Yeah. And typically what I usually do is I have a disclaimer because I, I, I double hat, but I don't double hat. And by what I mean by that is I either wear the hat of a commercial real estate broker or I wear the hat of attorney. I'm not going to do both at the same time because that's where you're going to get in trouble. So typically if I've got a, a project where I'm the commercial real estate broker, I'll go through stuff and I'll say, I can't give you legal advice. And I actually put that disclaimer in there. I'm your commercial real estate broker. I am not representing you as an attorney in this matter, but I have a whole stable full of great referrals for different real estate attorneys that can help people to go through that when they need that. So sometimes I've got situations with my business partner where she's got people going through and purchasing property. Um, she's handling the deal, but they need an attorney. So in that situation, I'll put on my attorney hat and I'll act in that legal capacity for them. Do you find sometimes your hats conflict with one another? I mean, just internally, you know, you're looking at this through the scope of, you know, a, a broker versus looking at the scope through the scope of an attorney and you smoke, okay, you know, you, you, you shut up hat, like I'm, I'm focusing over here this way. Like, do you find that that happens often? Um, it does. And typically when I find that there starts to be that conflict as to what to do on it, I remind myself I need to stay in whatever my lane is and something where it looks, if I'm on the commercial real estate side, I say, you need to have your attorney look at it. I cannot give you legal advice on this. We need to have an attorney take a look at it. And, you know, here's my list of three referrals so that you've got three different attorneys or more if those don't work out for someone. But you really need to stay in your lane, so to speak, to make sure that everything goes according to how it should be and that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed on these transactions. I'm interested, you know, as a broker and legal expert, what kind of clients do you work with? For me, I typically do people that have, um, they might need somebody to review a lease agreement. So for instance, I had a client where they were trying to get a tenant out. They need someone to sit down with the other attorney and negotiate an exit strategy for that, for that client and um, for that tenant to get them out. So I stepped in and I said, okay, let's take a look at it. So we negotiated an exit strategy for that current tenant that they had in there. Um, sometimes I'll have someone that just needs me to draft up a road use agreement. So I'll draft that up. Um, other times I might have somebody that needs me to draft up a limited liability, um, LLC, a limited liability company documents for them, their um, operating agreement and file documents for that. Sometimes it might be just taking a look through a title opinion and um, title commitment and seeing what's going on with that. And that's that was really one thing that really got me going, so to speak, where um, when I was doing a lot more legal work, for instance, in the Metro District world, where we would have people that would come to the Metro District board meetings and they'd say, well, I didn't know it was in a Metro District. And I ask, well, did you look at your title commitment? Because you, this is the biggest purchase that you're probably ever going to make in your lifetime. You know, you should, you need to have an attorney at least explain what all these documents mean and the agreements that are recorded against your property because the broker can't tell you, but the attorney can of what does it mean when you're in a metro district? You know, what does it mean when you have this type of easement across your property? So you've told me a little bit about some of the challenges that your clients uh, face. What are some of the opportunities they're taking advantage of right now? Some of the opportunities, I think right now what we're starting to see. So I was just at my Mile High Exchangers program on Wednesdays 
And on Wednesdays, we had one of the guys talking about they're starting to see the interest rates that, you know, they're starting to creep up a little bit. They're starting to pop up and nobody knows what's the Fed going to do. They're going up, they're going down. And we're starting to see prices go a little squishy. The other thing that we're starting to see, at least for the residential market, we're starting to see the a lot more inventory than what we've seen in perhaps years, because it's always a very tight, tart, very, very tight market, at least residential wise. Um, commercial, it's very, it, it's just very interesting right now because it depends on the company. You know, do they need to expand, not expand? Is it something that can last through a recession? Is it a company that that's going to do well? Does it have the type of product that people are going to need? I mean, take a look at COVID. During COVID, who knew that sign manufacturers and, you know, PPE and safety products, you know, sanitary products, those companies would be making bank during the pandemic where, you know, the poor little chiropractor that has his own family practice, he got shut down or even dentists were shut down. But, Here's, you know, here's a business that, you know, is putting signs together for people. And how many signs did we see stay six feet apart? It's, it's, you just don't quite know. And it's trying to find what is that sweet spot and where do you want to expand? The other thing that we're starting to see too is that life work balance. So by that, I mean, downtown Denver, everybody drove there, you know, went to work in the big buildings and now you know, when COVID hit, everybody had to work at home. So we're starting to see what's going to happen with some of those, with some of those buildings. Are those going to get filled back up again? Are companies finding that they need to have their employees in in order to manage the productivity and keep that productivity going? Or is it a type of company that you can actually have that live life work balance, so to speak, that as long as you've got high-speed internet connection, you're able to make your business go. So some people have found I can have an office at home. I, as long as I've got the high-speed internet or if I have an office that's maybe five minutes away from home, I can do exactly what I need to do. I don't necessarily need to be in a downtown Denver area or a downtown area. I can be more in the suburbs. Interesting. And, you know, I see that on my end too, being on the auction platform. We're seeing quite a bit of vacant office making its way to the, the auction side. Mm -hmm. And it's been a little bit of a challenge uh, as, you know, the, the interest for it isn't as hot as it used to be because I feel like a lot of investors, you know, are still feeling a little unsure about the future of, of office, not just, you know, in giant metros, but also, you know, suburban offices as well. You know, are they going to be filled back up? I have seen a lot of people coming in uh, looking to do adaptive reuse of offices and turn them in, into, you know, multi-tenant housing or kind of live work artist loft type, you know, uh, configurations because, uh, it may be a uh, higher and better use for it than an office, you know, where the market currently is. Um, now, with that in mind, I'm going to ask you to peer into your crystal ball a little bit and would like to hear <laughs> with your expertise, especially with your knowledge of the region and its land rights, what are your takes and predictions on the market? Where do you see things moving? Um, what's kind of the, the bird's eye view as you see it, you know, which way is the river turning? Denver is always going to be a hot market because a lot of people move here for the lifestyle. Um, where I live, I'm on the Western side of town. I'm 10 minutes from the local trails to go mountain biking, hiking, etc. I'm also 10 minutes to get up to I-70 to go, you know, skiing or get up to the mountains and just, you know, escape the city. So I think Denver will always be a very attractive Colorado in general, um, very attractive market for people to move here. Um, I'm a little nervous on home prices, um, just to see whether or not they're going to be able to, to stay at that at that price. As always, we're seeing an influx from other states that perhaps had a higher price point for their home so they can buy a lot more home. But it's also pushing out uh, some of the local people, so to speak. Um, my sons, I've got two sons, one's 25, the other's 22. 
you know, how long is it going to take for them to actually have the money to put down to get a house? You know, what does that look like for that generation? Is there a generation out there that that may not be able to have a home like my generation did? So I do see a lot more expansion of of the housing market. I see people all the time. Um, builders are looking for single family to get that built up, and they're looking just the changes I've seen since moving out here in 1995 to now 2022. Just the changes along the I-25 corridor and the I-70 corridor. Every time you look where there used to be somebody that was farming in the city, um, they're now not farming and it's getting gobbled up, so to speak, and it's being turned into the multifamilies and the single families. And it's just, it keeps spreading. And you can see that too, you know, by the traffic. It's just, traffic's crazy out here. But what I see, I think the Denver market will remain hot. I think the Colorado market will remain hot. Um, I do think with the office buildings, that's still a very squishy number on that, what's gonna happen with those. There are some office buildings on the um, C-470 corridor and C-470, for those of you not familiar with um, Denver, that is a highway, it's a bypass that goes on the Southern side of the town. You know, there's huge office buildings out in Highlands Ranch. Um, some of them have been sitting open and empty for a while because people were sent home and I'm not sure, you know, are they going to fill up? Are they not going to fill up? What's going to happen with that? So Wait. this is this is definitely a, a big question. I'm sure it's at the top of a lot of both investors and, and brokers' minds. What do you predict will happen to the market with rising interest rates? I know, especially this week, looking at what's happening in the stock market, um, there's a, a lot of uncertainty still floating around. What are you seeing? And you know, what are you advising clients? Right now, it depends what their portfolio looks like. Um, look at diversification. Look at you know where you can put your investments for stuff that people need to have. There, no matter what, with commercial real estate, there are some things that people need to have. Uh, people need to have grocery stores. People need to have the liquor stores. They need to have the the pet food stores. Um, interestingly enough, the the laundry facilities with you know dry cleaning. People aren't using as much as before, you know, will that continue or not? Um, the cobbler, you know, people need to go to those strip mall places, liquor stores, you know, they need to have, you know, those very basic services. There's some stuff, no matter what, you're, you're not just going to always pick it up at the curb, but you're still going to have to have that footprint location for that. Um, multifamily, I think, is, is a good option because you're looking at People aren't going to be able to afford houses. So what do you have out there for another housing option? Up in the mountains, one of the things they very much struggle with is workforce housing. So how do the ski towns, how do the Breckenridge, how do the Silverthorne, how do the Dillon, how do they provide those facilities for their workers to be there? Because without having a place to live, it's really hard to get workers to come, come up to the mountain towns. And I know that is one thing that has been a continuous struggle with a lot of the mountain towns trying to figure out what that is. Um, there are some things, again, specialty that, that, you, that you need. And you know, take a look at what it is and do an analysis of what's out there. You know, how many car washes are within a geographic location? What's the traffic count on that? Is that something that you know, maybe there's an opportunity there? Um, and then also take a lot, look at um, one of the resources I like is, you know, with Crexy Pro is just, you know, the resources that you have with Crexy Pro of, you know, what's out there right now, what's possible, what's what's sat on the market for a while, what hasn't sold in several years, and maybe that investor has reached the life on that investment property, and it, it's time to turn it over and get something else and invest in something else. So that's an opportunity. And keep track, too, of what is, you know, where those interest rates are going. I think everyone is just so very, very concerned about that and making sure that, um, you know, be nimble. That is the best thing is just to be nimble and be flexible because we just, there's so much uncertainty as to what is going to be happening here in, you know, after the election, after the midterms and what the feds are going to do. There's just a lot of question marks. So I would say be nimble.
be nimble and stay informed. Uh, yeah. And a lot of times, you know, that means, you know, if you're an owner, you're not necessarily an expert just because you're an owner, right? You know, you may have bought the property 30 years ago and you were an expert then when you bought it. Um, but if you don't have the time to track the market and changing laws and what's expected of you, um, you need an expert on your team that is tapped into the information and consistently updating it. Somebody that's living in the stream of info. Um, so yeah, be nimble and stay informed, you know, uh, Craig season, a great resource to be able to go online and as an open marketplace, see what's for sale, but there's no better resource than the boots on the ground broker that's in the trenches, closing deals, talking with owners, talking with sellers and, and putting these deals together. Um, you know, you're working on a deal that the rest of the market's not going to know about for 45, 60, 90 days, perhaps, right? But the info that you have today on working with it can inform somebody else's decision that can't even see that deal happening. So uh, it's always my recommendation, talk to a local market expert, right? Talk to somebody that knows what it is you're trying to do and has done it before and can help you get up to speed. Um, it can save you a lot of headaches later. Most definitely, because I mean, here's an example. Someone has heard, you know, through the grapevine, through their cousin's cousin, sister's brother in law, that Airbnbs are making bank right now. Well, they decide, I'm going to get an Airbnb. I'm going to buy this property up in Breckenridge and I'm going to Airbnb it and make, make a lot of money on it. Well, what are the local regulations on Airbnbs? You know, are they pulling back on some of them? Do you have to have it in a certain geographic location? Does it need to be, um, you know, only for a certain amount of time, is that truly going to work for your budget? How are you going to manage it? And so if you're not up on some of these local rules and regulations, like a broker that does have the boots on the ground, you may have just invested in something that you may not exactly have wanted to spend the money on. And with that, I'm going to transition into a kind of a fun uh, topic that I've got for you. It's a little bit of a rapid fire questions and words of advice for our listeners, you know, with your specialized background and expertise, I'm sure our listeners are curious about some of your answers to these. So I'm just going to fire them off at you and, um, you know, whatever, whatever comes to the top of your head. Um, I'll start with this first one, which is, you know, I think one that all of us would like to relate to and get an answer to. If you were given $10 million today, let's say tax-free and had to invest it immediately, what would your go-to asset type be and location? Why? $10 million to invest any place and no tax implications on it? Nope. Now it's kind of like a, uh, a Brewster's million, right? You got you to gotta spend it all before uh, the end of the day. If you were to just get $10 million today and you, know, you have to buy a deal, what are you looking at? I'd look at mini storage or multifamily. People have stuff and they can't fit it in their tiny little homes and mini storage where people need to park their stuff. And another thing, people bought all those RVs and now they got to figure out how do I park this because my HOA is getting really mad that that great camper that we had so much fun in is now sitting in the driveway. So I'd look at mini storage and I'd look at um, stuff that's more secure where you've got key lock entry, so you don't have quite the management on it, I would definitely look at that. Phenomenal. And, and I know um, exactly that you know what you're talking about uh, because we've got a RV spot um, that's going to auction pretty soon. Mm -hmm. And almost instantly, we had over 100 leads come and execute the confidentiality agreement on it. I think we've got over 25 people that have started registration. We've only been marketing it for about a week, but um, there are a lot of people very interested in the RV product type right now. So um, 10 million bucks, mini storage, multifamily, and maybe RV. Yep, there you go. Then you, you've you got that place is parked. Because like I said, if the economy is going to start to get squishy, um, people where they have put all that money in the single family homes, they may not be able to afford it and they're going to have to downsize. And so they're going to have to have a place to store their stuff because it, it will come back around. But where, you know, where do you put grandma's furniture that you just inherited? And it's like, doesn't quite fit in her house. We've got a stash at some place because we know we're going to use it at some point. Right. All right. Moving on to the next one, favorite tool or software you use on the job. 
favorite tool or software? Well, I would say I'm a word gal because um, that's always been my wheelhouse is always word, but I'm starting to get more up to date on Excel and working those formulas. At the end of the month, I'm taking an investment analysis class with uh, the Rural Realtor Land Institute. I'm working on my accredited land consultant designation. And so being able to figure out how to work all these formulas, I'm looking forward to that. It's funny, Word hasn't changed very much in you know 25 years and it's still the go-to software for word processing. It, it'll never be replaced. That's my, nope. that's my prediction. Um, most common misconception about what you do or the industry that you work in? Most common misconception about the industry we work in. I think that probably the most misconception is not all brokers are fly-by-night salespeople. There are actually people out there that want to be consultants, that want to be counselors, and really truly help people get to that next project. And like I said before, Westward Advisors is there to be that ranch, that resort, that investment, and that preservation piece. And so the misconception that, you know, all attorneys are fly by night, personal injury. There's some people out there, attorneys also like to do transactional work, which is, you know, a switch from doing the litigation. And brokers are not always fly by night salespeople. You need, there are brokers out there that will listen and figure out what what's you know what are options for you and ask those probing questions absolutely there are uh, not everybody's a Saul Goodman out there no <laughs> finally what is in your opinion been the best or even most creative use of land that you've seen in your career so far best or most creative use of land you know, it really depends. I, I have seen so many different uses for lands that, um, you know, here's one thing. I-70 corridor, you're driving up the I-70 corridor. There used to be the Colorado rafting company so you could river raft down Clear Creek. Well, now there's a zip line out there. So if you're done with river rafting for the day, now you can do zip lining for the day. I mean, expanding those recreational opportunities out there. Um, the glamping. Who knew that you know your tent with throwing down your thermal rest was not going to be sufficient, that you want more of the higher end camping, which is the glamping that people are craving for out there. I recently glamped in a uh, constructed yurt that had a little wood fire in it, and, you know, some nice amenities, there's electricity. And it was, I mean, smack dab in the middle of nowhere with a river, you know, bending around it. And I gotta tell you, uh, I'm hooked, you know, it's nice to be able to, you know, walk in and like, you know, close the flap behind you and not have to worry about spiders and insects. It's warm. You've got a little, you know, stove in there. I really enjoyed it. I definitely see um, that trend, especially as you look on social media. Um, people are always posting about their travels, where they've stayed. And, you know, less and less you see people actually roughing it, you know. Uh, and that's definitely a, um, a very astute uh, observation in terms of, okay, what, what are people doing? Um, well, people may not want to store an RV or a trailer. And um, so just go use the facilities of glamping where, you're, where you're, you're out there in the wild, but you still have the amenities. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it, it's, yeah, if you haven't done it yet, I highly recommend it. You know, even if you're a hardcore camper, set up my own you know, tent and build my own fire by hand, give, give it a whirl. I think you'd be surprised at how nice it is. Yeah. That takes us to the end of our talk track. Um, but before we go, I wanted to see, you know, do you have any advice to newcomer, newcomer brokers or developing professionals in your industry? What, what basic advice would you give to somebody that's just, that's excited about this and just getting into it? Well, one of the things that I would recommend is recently, actually on Monday, I took a client counseling class. And as I mentioned, I belong to the Mile High Exchangers here in Denver. And getting, never lose sight of always learning. 
how you can help your clients. The client counseling class was great. Ted Blank put it on. He is with um, the exchangers group and it was just so informative. It was two, three tracks. You had beginners, intermediate and advanced. And we had people in there that had been in the industry for 30, 40 years, but they're always learning and listening to your clients. You're, you're not a salesperson, you're a counselor. What, what are they trying to say? And if you pause, what can you learn? What, what is in between those dashes that your client is trying to tell you? I would also make sure that it's important to get those accreditations, but make sure it's accreditations that are going to work for what you're going to do. So for instance, for me, I'm late, late bloomer, so to speak, on the commercial real estate broker um, for my career. So I looked at doing the CCIM and I looked at and I thought, oh, that's a lot of money. I'm not quite sure that's where I want to spend my education dollars. And my passion is more with land. So I took a look and found Realtor Land Institute. So instead, I'm working on my accredited um, land consultant to get that designation. That's going to fit well for me. But if you're a younger broker, you know, take a look at the CCIM classes or some of those other um, accreditations that you receive because there is such great information that you get. Um, learn formulas. Um, learn how to talk with people, how to um, understand people and never stop learning um, because there is just so much out there. The day you stop learning, well, that's the day you're going to die because there is just so much information of how you can help your clients. And that's, I think, as brokers, we need to remember that we're there to help people. We're not there to just sell, 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 because by helping people, what you're going to build is you're building your career. You want to build that career so that what you're doing is you get those repeat clients, you get those referrals, where if you just sell, you're in and out and that's it. Well, the long-term relationship of someone doing that investment and preservation may not occur. So take a look at building those relationships. Absolutely. And I think that's such a, uh, an important point, you know, regardless of what you do in commercial real estate or law, it's, you know, have longevity. And if you put the clients first, they will not only come back to you, but they're going to recommend friends and family members. They're going to gush about how amazing you are, how you did such a, you know, such a good job um, and, and get obsessed with whatever it is that you want to focus on, right? If it's land or apartments or retail or industrial or a specific geographic area, a great piece of advice that I was given when I first started commercial real estate was get obsessed, right? No right. more than everybody else in that corridor, in that market, in that product type. And then you quickly become an invaluable resource uh, because there's nobody that knows more about it than you. And when you know the most, you can really help the most. A great way to think about it is the riches are in the niches. So what is that niche that you can specialize in? I love that. The riches are in the niches. That I'm saving that one. Wow, that was incredible. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights. I know you're very busy and we really appreciate you spending the time to sit down with us. Well, thank you. I have got to say that I so this has been just unbelievable to have this opportunity with you and I have to put a small plug in with for Christ. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, oh, I'll, go, I'll let you go ahead first. <laughs> So what? So I initially had you know the free subscription for Crexy, but then um, so I was looking at property, and all of a sudden I got this phone call, and I looked at my phone, and it was the broker on the property I was just looking at, and she said, "Oh, I saw you were looking at her property." I said, "How did you know? Were you stalking me?" She says, "Oh, I have Crexy Pro," and you know it texts me when someone looks at the property. I thought. What a great tool. And so now I know with the listings, if somebody's looking at it, I can be Johnny on the spot and be responsive for my clients. And that was something I didn't have with any other uh, program that we were looking at for databases. And so I just have to say, thank you. And I'm just so grateful I've got that as a, another tool in my toolbox for commercial real estate. That makes me so happy to hear, um, specifically because I, I tell brokers all the time. Um, 
you know, if you have Crexy Pro, you have this unique ability to connect with people in real time as they're looking at your inventory. And if you're not taking advantage of that, you're missing one of the best tools that Crexy gives you. Somebody opened your OM, and while you're looking at it, the listing agent called you to talk about the deal. I mean, is there a better time to call an interested party than when they're at their computer shopping for commercial real estate? Oh yeah, and by the way, they're looking at your deal right now, right? Like that's a very warm call. Well, exactly. And the thing that to also keep in mind is, you know, what else are they looking for? If this isn't a good fit, well, tell me more about what you're looking for. What's your ideal property look like? Where, where do you want to be? Uh, what does it need to have for a cap rate coming back at you? Um, you know, and find out and say, you know, may I put you on my mailing list? So as stuff comes in, I can keep you apprised of that. Amazing. Oh, I'm, I'm, that makes me so happy to hear you're using it exactly the way that it was designed to be used and it's getting you results. And that puts a big smile on mine and everybody else's face at Crexy. Uh, we love hearing deals get done. Um, wow. We, we really shot through our whole talk track here. Uh, before we go, where can people get in touch with you? Because I'm sure you're going to get a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Is the best way to reach you online? Is there an email, a website? Um, yes, you can. My email is Cynthia, C Y N T H I A, at westwardbroker.com. And check out Westward Advisors on social media. We have um, a YouTube channel, we have an Instagram channel, we are also on LinkedIn and also on Facebook. So please check us out. We've got lots of different adventures. Uh, Lindsay, my business partner, is got the market up there on Breckenridge, what's going on up in the mountains. And um, my goal is to eventually be up there. Right now, I'm just traveling up the hill, so to speak, to get up to the mountains, but that's the best way to get a hold of us. And I believe it's westwardcommercial.co is our website for Westward Advisors, at least for the commercial side. And we'll include a link as well uh, so that viewers can, can find you easily. Thank you, Cynthia, and thanks to everyone who tuned in today. If you enjoyed this episode, do not miss the next one. Visit go.crexy.com forward slash podcast and sign up to get the next episode delivered directly to your inbox. Of course, you can also subscribe to the Crexy podcast on your favorite podcast app and check out our YouTube channel for video recordings of each episode. Take care and be sure to tune in next time. Thank you.